guys, welcome back. Now, last time we talked about light and what that light is telling us about stars. And so what I want to do today is go ahead for this session and talk about censuses and distances. So in other words, kind of an introduction to looking at the stars out there, what we call them, what they do, and exactly what's going on out there. Now, all the stars that we're looking at, starting from these pictures, are stars that were within our galaxy. Okay? We'll go outside the galaxy when we start talking about cosmology and galaxies in the next unit. So as we start talking about senses and distance, we're talking about what kind of stars are out there and how far away they are. Now remember, our sun's only 93 million miles away, but that's our nearest star. And man, once we get to the next one, it's really far away. So let's think about distances. And these are stellar distances, not distances within our solar system. And the distances to stars are measured in light years. Now I know the word is light years, and it's given the um, symbol the Y or L Y, but guys, it really is measuring a distance. And a light year is the distance that light travels in a year. Now, remember that the speed of light is three times ten to the eighth meters per second, or if you're not used to thinking about the metric system, it's 186,000 miles per second. Think about that, guys. 186,000 miles per second. Certainly never going to be a velocity that we even remotely approach. But we do know that there are subsumatomic particles that do certainly approach, you know, looking at 99.9% .9 the speed of light. And when we talk about cosmology and the universe and what it's like, we'll find out that when we talk about a black hole and light can't escape from a black hole, that things get really weird as you start going those appreciable percentages of the distance that light travels. So when you get up to 99.9% .9 the speed of light, your time changes and your length does some weird things and your mass does some weird things. So we'll go ahead and talk about that then. Now distances in the solar system, however, remember are measured in astronomical units. And I just kind of showed you here looking at the distance to Pluto, which is our outermost dwarf planet right now, that you're probably more familiar with. There certainly are planets dwarf planets on the other side of Pluto. But if I just think about the distance to Pluto in light years, that's 1.6 times 10 to the minus fifth light year. So you can see that within our solar system, even at these great distances, man, that's nothing compared to what we're talking about when we talk about what's going on to the stars. You know, there are distances between stars are incredibly large. So when we talk about our neighborhood within the solar system, you know, they really are like they're right next to you like within the same house. And then we start talking about the stars, much larger distances. The nearest star is about 4.2 light years away, obviously other than our sun. And the other thing I want you to know about distances to stars is they're measured in parsecs. And one parsec is 3.26 light years. There's a couple of ways that we can measure distance. One of them is called measuring distance by parallax. And the other one is more of a period luminosity relationship within stars. So I want you to think about parallax. Okay, I want you to physically do this, guys. Uh, although I can't see you do this, but I want you to physically do this. I want you to hold one arm out in front of you at arm's length and put one finger up. Okay, so I've got my arm out at arm's length and I've got one finger that's held up. And I want you to open and close one eye. So you're opening and closing that eye. And what you should see is you should see the background that you're looking at shifting. Well, that background as it shifts is what we call parallax. It's that apparent shift of the star in this case due to the way that I'm looking at that star. Well, that gives me an indication then on how much that background is switching where that star is. And part of the problem that we had the ancient people did in first looking at stars and trying to determine the distance was they couldn't measure any parallax. And that's because the stars were so far away. You know, we simply can't see that shift in background because they're so far away. So we just felt like they weren't that far then. So now if we talk about a precise period luminosity relationship, that comes out with what's going on within the star itself. And we find there's two kinds of variable stars. 
One of them is called a Cepheid variable star, and the other one's an IR, excuse me, an RR Lyra star. And it works great because these things have very precise period luminosity relationships. Now remember luminosity we're talking about is that energy per unit time, so we're talking about power. Another way a lot of people think about it, although it's incorrect, is looking at a brightness, so a period and a brightness relationship. And Cepheid variables and our, our Lyra variables vary with a very precise period. And so if we can go ahead and measure the period of that change within that star, then we will know exactly what then that brightness is. And once we know the brightness, we can look then at the relationship between distance and how much material we think that starlight's coming through. And so it gives us a nice relationship. Now, if we look at something called spectroscopy, well, that's really the study of light as it breaks down into its component parts. And we had talked a little bit about that last time when we talked about the spectrum of stars. And so really, when we look at stars, we are talking about looking at the light, uh, which is called photometry, and then we look at taking that light and breaking it down into its component parts, and that's really called the spectroscopy. And both of those become extremely important in looking at the characteristics of those stars. Now, from those stellar spectrums, and we, again, I alluded to this last time when we talked about that, but I think it's well worth it bringing it back up again. Look at all the things that you can come up with from these spectra. We can talk about composition, abundance, pressure, and density, temperature, you know, rotational speed, radio velocity, all that kind of stuff. And remember, this is the only way we have of finding out a lot of that information from the stars. So it's a very important that we make these measurements. And you've seen this picture before, too. That's a sun spectra. Notice that you've got this nice continuous spectrum, the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet, with this absorption spectrum on top of it. And very distinct patterns within that absorption spectrum will tell us then what the chemicals are in the outer envelopes of the sun. Remember, guys, we're not going to be able to tell anything below the surface, that photosphere, simply because we can't see into the interior. We have to use other ways to do that. Hopefully, guys, between last time and now, you had a chance to go listen to the sun singing you know, about those vibrational modes within the sun. Now, we haven't talked about um, looking at characterizing those stars based on their spectra. Remember we talked last time about the three different types of spectra, the continuous, the bright line or emission spectrum, and then the dark line or absorption spectrum. But taking those spectrums into account, and I'm going to look at these stars, how do I classify those stars? Well, I want you to know that the primary reason that stellar spectra are going to look different is because those stars have different temperatures. And let me stress, when we look at those temperatures, we again are talking about the temperatures within that photosphere and that area. We're not talking about what's going on within the star, nor are we talking about what goes on within the core because that's the only place that we've got the light coming from is from that photosphere. Okay, so that then tells us something about the materials that make up the photosphere and the temperature that those materials have. Now the different temperatures are going to cause those chemicals to behave differently. They can become ionized. Now ionized simply means that I take an atom and I strip off the outer electrons Therefore, you have ions, and those I can strip off one, I can strip off two. It just kind of depends on the energy that's going to be required to strip those electrons. We know when we talk about the atoms inside the core of the star, those temperatures are so high and those pressures are so great that we do not have an atom inside the core. We have what's left of that atom after you strip off the electrons, in which case we're talking about the nucleus of the atom. And as those chemicals then become ionized, then they're going to behave differently than their neutral atom, in which case all of my electrons are put back in there. Now, the other thing is you can also go ahead and look at the different spectrum lines, and you're going to be able to identify what those particular chemicals are based on that temperature. We find that the hottest stars tend to have very little lines in their spectra. Now, let's think about that. They have very little lines. Well, I've got the lines in there that are corresponding to those electrons jumping up from higher energy levels down to lower energy levels. So that's when that energy gets given off. Well, if those electrons are completely gone and they've been stripped away because of the really hot temperatures, then it makes sense that I'm not going to see too many lines because I don't have too many electrons there 
to go ahead and absorb or radiate that energy off. And so I'm going to show you a picture here, kind of a diagram of what they look like. And then I'm also going to take you to the Internet and go ahead and have you look at some stellar spectra and show you what it means when we talk about a star that doesn't have very many spectral lights compared to a star that's extremely cool, in which case you have not only atoms, but you have molecular lines that tend to show up. We've said this before, guys. Just want to keep reminding you, most of those stars, or the majority of the material in those stars are hydrogen and helium. But yet, when we look at these envelopes of stars, that's where you get a lot of the other chemicals that you have in there. And so when we look at our sun, I showed you a picture of the sun that was taken with uh, kind of a greenish color that was basically showing the iron in the sun. We're just looking at what's going on within that surface. So in general, the younger the star, the greater amount of those heavier elements that you're going to see. We talked about our sun being a third generation star. Okay, because it is a younger star, it's made up of a third generation star, you're going to see more of those heavier elements. And unlike every other science discipline out there, when we talk about heavier elements, we're talking about anything that's basically beyond helium. If I'm a physics person and I talk about a heavier element, I'm talking about things like uranium and, and those kinds of elements. The hottest stars are going to be classified as O-type stars. And yes, guys, I do want you to go ahead and know the order of this. So the hottest stars are classified as O-type stars, and the coolest stars are classified as M-type stars. And then we now have some other divisions. We've got an L-type star, things like that. And each class then is divided into 10 subcategories. So it's O, B, A, F, G, K, M, and then sometimes you'll see that L. So O, B, A, F, G, K, M, and L. Now this is that graph that I was talking about. Am I ever going to have you repeat this on a test? Absolutely not. But I at least want you to be familiar with it so if you saw that with all the labels on it, you kind of understand what it means. So now look at the bottom. We have plotted spectral classes. Now notice on this one I did leave out the L since that was not one of the traditional ones. So O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. Now for those of you that might have a hard time remembering the order, we have a little saying that goes along with that order. Now first thing I want you to remember that most early astronomers were men. And then ladies will talk about how we've kind of redone that for the women. Okay, so remember if you're an early astronomer you're probably a man. Okay, O, B, A, F, G, K, M stands for, to help you remember it, O, B, A, fine girl, kiss me. So, O, B, A, fine girl, kiss me. And we have some other ones which I, you know, the R and the M and the L. You can do that right now, smack, kind of whatever. But at least the main parts, O, B, A, fine girl, kiss me. So ladies, the way that we rewrote that for us was, oh, be a fine guy, kiss me. Luckily, girl and guy start with a G, so it works out really well. So guys, if you need to have something to kind of help you memorize it, that little sentence works really well. So on the horizontal axis, or the x-axis, then we have spectral classifications. And we will come back to what that spectral classification means when we start talking about the HRI diagram here real shortly. And then on the vertical axis, or the y-axis, we have relative strengths of the types of chemicals that we're talking about. Now you can see in those O-type stars, notice I have in green listed as very hot stars, and I have the M stars listed as very cool stars. So if I look at that blue line, and notice that they kind of overlap going all the way over, it looks like kind of a nice you know, skyline of a bunch of mountains. The O-type stars have a number of ionized helium. So that's what the relative abundance of what I see in those O-type stars are ionized helium. For a B-type star, I'm looking at neutral helium. Neutral helium means that I have all my electrons in there. And if you remember your periodic table, guys, helium has 
two protons, two neutrons. And when it's neutral, it has two electrons. Electrons being electrically negative, protons being electrically positive. Now I get down to an A-type star. I have lots of hydrogen in there that's showing up. Get down to kind of between an F and a G-type star. And by the way, guys, our sun is a G-type star. We have ionized metals because remember, as we are moving horizontally over, then the star temperature is getting much cooler. So I have ionized metals. Then I have, for a K-type star, neutral metals. And then by the time I get down to those M-type stars, like I said, they're cool enough that you're actually able to keep the molecules together. And as we talk about the evolutionary sequence of stars and what they're doing, we'll kind of talk about how the temperature of that star is changing and why you then get a change of what you see in the atmosphere due to that temperature change. Now, if I look at every one of those stars there, and there's a lot of them, and if you look closely, guys, you see a lot of color in this picture. Well, that color of that star is certainly going to give us an indication then of the temperature of that star, which gives us a temp an indication then of what the star is doing in its evolutionary sequence, how it's going to change, all these other characteristics that go along with looking at the, envelope, the outer envelope of the star. Now, the other thing I want to point out is all those stars are in our galaxy. And so for this chapter, or this unit, we're really only going to be talking about just the stars within our galaxy. And then as we go ahead and move out and talk a little bit more of other galaxies and you know, cosmology in general and what our universe is doing, we'll come back to the fact that we see what's going on within our galaxy of these stars in terms of other galaxies. And so it helps us make some assumptions about what's happening out there. I still like this picture, though, guys. There's a whole lot of stars in that picture. And we also know that, as we've talked in the last time over solar systems, that a lot of those stars probably have solar systems. Are we ever going to be able to, you know, send a message out there and get a message back from one of those really, really, really distant stars? Probably not, but it doesn't mean that they don't exist and that they might have somebody out there that's doing exactly the same thing that we're doing right now and looking at us instead of us looking at them. Now, you need to become very familiar with something called the HR diagram because really that's going to tell us what's going on within the star and more importantly how that star is going to evolve and change through its lifetime. Now, HR stands for Herbst from Russell, so obviously they both discovered it right around the same time and so they both got credit for it. And it's a plot of absolute magnitude versus spectral classification and temperature. And there's a couple of ways that we're going to look at the plotting of the HR diagram. I don't care which way, you know. Most people look at it as brightness and temperature, but it's probably more correctly absolute magnitude and spectral classification. But the shape of the HR diagram looks exactly the same. Like I said, we use the HR diagram for looking at what's going on within the star, looking at the characteristics of that star, and then what happens as the star moves through its evolutionary sequence. And it gives us a feel then for the characteristics and the behavior of what that star is doing. Now, this is a picture of the HR diagram without um, axes on it. And no, it's not really just a bunch of bees flying around or birds flying around. It's actually an HR diagram. And so we've got stars plat plant plotted. Sorry about that, guys. Plotted on there instead of all these, you know, birds that it looks like flying around or bees or something like that. Now, notice that you've got a single main line coming through that HR diagram. We're going to call that the main sequence line. And that's that really dark line that starts up at the upper right and continues down through the lower left. And notice that as it continues, boy, that was wrong. How about upper left down through the lower right? Okay, so as it continues from the upper left down to the lower right, notice it's going to get wider. And in fact, it's the widest down at the lower right and thinnest at the upper left. And then about halfway through there, notice it kind of takes off toward the upper right and then gets kind of wide and a little bit thinner there, or a little bit wider and a little bit not quite as intense, and kind of heads up to the upper left part as well. And then we've got this line that's in the lower kind of center of it and comes from the middle down to the right again. Well, each one of those correspond to a particular area. And the HR diagram you guys are going to have, in fact, that you've got, um, 
is one that's going to be labeled and looks probably a little bit more like this. But I just thought that other one was kind of cool with the colors and you just kind of get a feeling for what it looks like to start with. So let's look at an HR diagram that does have plots on it and, and does have axes labeled, things like that. And so that's what you see right here. And so those regions within the HR diagram have very specific names and have then very specific stars on what's going on. But let's start with our axis. Notice that you have on the vertical axis, you have that listed as luminosity. And then we've got the horizontal axis listed as temperature. And then we also have listed as spectral types, the O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. Now, if I look, I know that that 25,000 is very, very hot, down to that 3,000 on the lower right, which is very cool. So that means the upper left means that I have stars that are very, very hot and very bright, whereas the lower left has very hot stars that are very dim. Then if I go to the other side, on the right side, I have stars that are on the right side, on the very, very upper part, that are very, very, very bright, but they are very cool. And then in the lower right, I have stars that are very cool and very dim. And I've also labeled that on your HR diagram. Now that main sequence line, that line that starts at the upper left and heads down to the lower right is the one I was talking about that kind of starts out very thin and then gets thicker as it moves down. And like I said, we call that the main sequence line and there's something very specifically going on within the core of those stars that are on the main sequence line. And I will tell you that our sun is on the main sequence line. Then from the main sequence line heading up kind of like to that upper right are regions that are called giants and supergiants. And they're exactly what they mean. If you talk about a giant, then it's a much bigger star. If we talk about a supergiant, then I want you to think about putting a supergiant where our sun is and that outer layer of that supergiant is going to be out toward Jupiter's orbit. I mean, guys, we're going to look like a small little, you know, dot next to these big supergiants. Well, those supergiants are heading toward the end of their evolutionary sequence, and they have swollen up quite a bit. You know, but think about a star that is sitting where our sun is with its orbit out by Jupiter. That means we would actually be on our orbit of the Earth inside the sun. And then in the lower left, you have a few stars there in a region called the white dwarfs. And that's always going to be true. You're not going to have nearly as many of white dwarfs as you do the giants and the supergiants, and then not nearly as many giants and supergiants as you have with those main sequence stars. Now, if you see, look at the top of this, this is Herbson Russell diagram for stars in the solar neighborhood. And so that's basically for the stars that are around us, but yet yeah, this is also a good indication of all the stars that we see. You know, they're still going to form a main sequence line. There's going to be a region that are the giant region. There's going to be a region of supergiants, and then there's going to be regions of the white dwarfs. Now, if we talk about the size of stars, and this is in general, guys, please realize that, you know, you will get some um, exceptions to this depending on what's going on with that star. But for the most part, if I talk about a supergiant, then, you know, it's a really big star, <laughs> which means we're looking at, you know, things that are around 100 times or so the size of our sun. Giant on the other hand, or, you know, someplace between the size of our sun, you know, and about a hundred times. Main sequence stars are about 0.1% up to about 20 suns. You know, that's a main sequence star. White dwarfs, which I know we haven't talked about white dwarfs and brown dwarfs yet, and we will in just a minute. Uh, white dwarfs tend to range from about 0.01 to about 0.1 times the size of our sun, and those are the ones that were in the lower um, left-hand side. And then those brown dwarfs are at the very end over there at the lower right, almost right below that main sequence line. And they're stars that are very tiny. And so we find that they certainly are not going to go through the kinds of evolutionary sequences that the main sequence star is doing, going as a giant or a supergiant and ending up as a white dwarf. So brown dwarfs just have a little bit different characteristics and 
sometimes you talk about them as substars as opposed to just a little brown dwarf. Now, if we think about a star on that main sequence line, and we're certainly going to talk about uh, the HR diagram here before too long and spend a great deal of time talking about what's happening there. But that star in the main sequence line spends about 90% of its total lifetime on that line. And that's because when we look at what's going on within the core, it's converting hydrogen to helium, and so it's doing what a normal star does. And so that means, guys, when it moves off the main sequence line, we are not necessarily in any way, shape, or form converting hydrogen to helium. We're doing something else. The only thing that main stars, main sequence stars differ is by their mass and their composition. Mass being the main way that you look at the difference between main sequence stars. Composition, like I said, it kind of depends on we're talking a you know, first generation, second generation, or third generation star. And we find if I go back and I look at this line again and this diagram, that my really big giant stars, not super giants, but just those really big massive stars, they're still main sequence stars, are at the upper left hand. And notice I don't have that many of those guys. You know, those tend to be somewhat rare. Where if I look at the main sequence stars that are on the lower right, and even from about halfway down, I get lots more stars. You know, there's hundreds of times more of those red giants, excuse me, red dwarfs, than there are going to be than those really, really, really large giants. And the red dwarfs tend to be right down here in this region, right through here. So we've got those nice, big, huge, huge stars up here, and then we get a little bit larger in terms of the number, and then we get massive numbers down here. Okay. And then, of course, we got the giants, and we got the super giants, and we got these little white dwarfs. Remember I said the brown dwarfs tended to lie right below our main sequence line? We're going to find brown dwarfs that would lie right along here. They're just not quite behaving like a main sequence star. Now, if I look at where our sun is, our sun, notice that that's the luminosity of our sun, is kind of right there. We're finding we're a G2 star. So, you know, we're right about this region right through here. Remember when we first talked about our sun? Our sun um, is larger than about 85% of all the stars out there. Well, this, this is what I'm talking about. There's, you know, about 15% of the stars are above here. About 85% of the stars are back down here. This is just look, looking at a luminosity versus temperature, but just looking at the stars that are very, very, very close to our sun. And so you can see that here's us. There we are, guys, a nice yellow sun. Remember, we're looking at about 5,800K for a temperature of our photosphere. There's that luminosity of one over here. And there's our star. And you can see that I don't have that many stars above us on the main sequence line, but I certainly do have a lot more down here. These little guys, remember, are white dwarfs, giant or supergiant, and that percentage doesn't count those guys. Those are doing something different. When we talk about that 85% that is smaller than our sun, we are talking about main sequence lines right through there. Now, as I said, that star spends about 90% of its life as a main sequence star. And then it's going to start evolving off the main sequence line. And what determines how it evolves off the main sequence line is its size. If it's a giant or a super giant, you know, it's going to do one thing. If it's a, you know, uh, down there at the lower end, it's going to do something else. If it's us, then we're going to evolve this way based on our mass. Notice it. Few enough, about fewer than 1% of the stars are large enough to become supergiants, and so those stars are these guys right up here. Sorry, guys, we're never going to make a supergiant. We will make a giant, but just not a supergiant. Now, if I look at those 85% of the stars that are smaller than the sun, and certainly then these stars right here, then we find that, you know, all they're going to do is just continually, basically cool off until they're no longer visible. 
you know, and we know those low mass stars are the most numerous throughout the galaxy, but, you know, I tend to like stars that go off with really big bangs or form neat patterns when they go off. So, you know, we've never really seen those small red dwarfs do anything more than gradually cool off. And in fact, we've really never seen one of those small red dwarfs actually go through its entire evolutionary sequence. And we will find some globular clusters that seem to have a lot of new stars in them. And so something obviously has been going on, and when we talk about galaxies that are colliding, things like that, we'll come back and talk about why some of those globular clusters might have lots of new stars in them. So what's happening? Which means that you've got to have a lot of gas and dust in there to go ahead and get those stars to form. So with that, guys, I want to go ahead and leave this one. And our next section, which will be short as well, we'll be talking about gas and dust clouds in space. Once we finish that, then we're ready to head on and really start looking at stars and making stars. So with that, talk to you later.